This is the section on carbohydrates. The classification of carbohydrates is based on the following. One, the size of the um, base carbon train and how many carbons it has, and the location of the carboxyl function group. And aldose has a carbonyl group on the end, and a ketose has it in the middle. Here's an example of what that might look like. Here we have it on the end, and over here we have it in the middle. The classification of carbohydrates depends on the number of sugar units. For example, a monosaccharide has one sugar unit. These contain trioses, tetroses, pentoses, and hexoses. Some examples are glucose, fructose, and galactose. They're the most simple sugar and cannot be further reduced. A disaccharide is two sugar units. Examples of this are maltose, lactose, and sucrose. Sucrose refers to your common table sugar. Oligosaccharides are 3 to 10 sugar units, and polysaccharides are greater than 10 sugar units. Examples of polysaccharides include starch, glycogen, and... We also have some chemical properties of carbohydrates. Some of them are referred to as reducing carbohydrates, and some are referred to as non-reducing carbohydrates. The reducing carbohydrates must have a ketone or an aldehyde group. All monosaccharides and many disaccharides are reducing agents. Examples of these include glucose, maltose, fructose, lactose, and galactose. Now, non-reducing carbohydrates do not have a ketone or aldehyde group and will not reduce, for example, sucrose or table sugar. They need sucrase available to hydrolyze the sucrose into glucose. For glucose metabolism, the primary source of energy for humans, nervous system totally depends on glucose from the extracellular fluid. So if you were going to eat table sugar, you'd have to have sucrase available to turn it into glucose in order to metabolize it. So let's look at the fate of the food that you eat. Most of your carbohydrates that you eat are starch or glycogen. For example, a bagel, even a, um, pasta, things like that. These are converted to disaccharides, and disaccharides are converted to monosaccharides by enzymes. The monosaccharides are then absorbed by your gut and transported to the liver. Glucose is the only carbohydrate directly used for energy, so any type of carbohydrate you eat must be broken down into glucose. Glucose is used for energy or stored as glycogen in your liver and muscles until needed. Galactose and fructose must be converted to glucose. Again, they must be converted down to monosaccharides. Once the glucose enters the cell, it is shunted into one of three metabolic pathways, but the ultimate goal of the cell is to convert glucose to carbon dioxide and water once it's used for energy. Here are some terms that you have to know. A lot of test questions and quiz questions are going to be based off of these, so make sure that you memorize them. The first one is glycolysis. This is the conversion of glucose into lactase or pyruvate. The next one, gluconeogenesis, I'm going to point out neo, which means new, is the formation of new glucose from non-carbohydrate sources, such as amino acids, glycerol, and lactate. This happens in starvation or during weight loss when you want to use um, some other things. If you don't have a lot of glucose available, it can turn um, other things into sugar for use. Glycogenolysis. Check out your word parts here. Glycogen and lysis. This is taking glycogen and breaking it down into glucose. We have glycogenesis. Genesis meaning new, like the first book of the Bible is Genesis because it's new. It's a conversion of glucose to glycogen for storage. Then we have lipogenesis, which is the conversion of carbs to fatty acids, which we all don't like. And lipolysis is turning fat into a product that can be turned into glucose. So you do need to be familiar with all of those. The regulation of carbohydrate metabolism is controlled by many things. The liver, pancreas, and other endocrine glands aid in the controlling of your blood glucose levels. They all kind of work together. When you have a brief fast where you haven't eaten, let's say you've got a case of the flu, which is what I'm seeing online a lot lately, uh, people having the flu, well, glucose is supplied to the extracellular fluid from the liver through glycogenolysis. Okay, it's breaking down glycogen and turning it into glucose so that you can use it for energy even though you're not eating. Although if you've been fasting for longer than a day, you may run out of glycogen 
and the glucose then would be made from other sources through gluconeogenesis. We referred to some hormones with the regulation of carbohydrate metabolism, which you'll need to be familiar with. The liver, pancreas, and other organ um, endocrine glands control blood glucose concentrations within a narrow range. Here are the hormones that control glucose levels. Insulin is the first one. It comes from the pancreas. This is the only one that decreases blood glucose. It is the only one. We call it a hypoglycemic agent. What it does is it allows the cells to use glucose. It kind of opens the hatch and says, okay, glucose, come on in. The other ones you see listed here all increase blood glucose. Glucagon, epinephrine and glucocorticoids, growth hormone, adrenal corticotropic hormone, thyroxine, and somatostatin. So if you have a hard time knowing which ones do what, if you just know that insulin in decreases it, you know the rest of them pretty much increase it. Let's look at hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia is an increase in plasma glucose levels caused by an imbalance of hormones. The hormone cortisol can actually encourage hyperglycemia, which is a stress hormone you may have heard about. But we're going to talk about diabetes mellitus specifically. This is a group of metabolic diseases characterized by hyperglycemia resulting from defects in insulin secretion, insulin action, or both. Glucoseuria, which is glucose in the urine, after tubular, um, trans or can occur after tubular transporter system for glucose becomes saturated. So if you have diabetes and your blood sugar gets too high, we start to find sugar in the urine, which is normally not there. All right, let's look at the two different types of diabetes. Type 1. This results from a cellular-mediated autoimmune destruction of the beta cells in the pancreas. The beta cells in the pancreas are what make insulin. So if your body has autoimmune antibodies destroying those cells that make insulin, insulin is not going to be available for your cells to use glucose. What happens, the cells are essentially starved of gluco glucose and um, blood sugar just gets higher and higher. This constitutes about 1, 10 to 20 of percent of all diabetes cases, usually occurs in childhood and adolescence and is very much genetic. We see a lot of weight loss. We see an absence of insulin with excess glucagon and a greater tendency to produce ketones, which we're going to talk about at the end of this section. The next one is type 2. This is referred to as the adult onset type of diabetes. With this one, we see hyperglycemia caused by insulin resistance. Usually in this case, your carbohydrate levels have been high, therefore your glucose levels remain high, and you end up with a resistance to insulin. It just can't keep up and do its job anymore. Risk factors for this, age, obesity, lack of exercise, and having a genetic predisposition. I think the first um, three are probably more of a um, issue. The presence of insulin and hyperinsulinemia. We do have a lot of insulin, it just doesn't work. Greater tendency to develop hyperosmolar non-ketotic states. So ketones are usually not increased here. And there's not weight loss, it's usually obesity. We see um, sometimes a genetic defect of the beta cell function or insulin action. Sometimes pancreatic um, and endocrine diseases can cause this. Then we have gestational diabetes, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But first, let's look at the criteria for testing for prediabetes and diabetes. All adults over age 45 should have a fasting blood glucose measured every three years, unless already diagnosed with diabetes. Testing should be done earlier or more frequently if you have these risk factors. If you're overweight with a BMI of greater than 25, if you're habitually not active, if you have a family history, if you are a high-risk minority population, such as African-American or Latino, or if you have a history of gestational diabetes or delivering a baby greater than 9 pounds. Also, having high blood pressure of greater than 140 over 90. The criteria for testing for prediabetes and diabetes depends on a few things. If you have a family history, your race, signs of insulin resistance, and having a maternal history as well. All right, some other criteria are how we diagnose a patient with diabetes. The three methods of diagnosis include, number one, having diabetes symptoms and a random glucose of greater than 200. Right there, diabetic. You should not have a glucose that high. 
having a fasting glucose of greater than 126, if you haven't eaten and your glucose is still that high, it means you're having issues using your um, glucose. Having an oral glucose tolerance test, which is what they, what they do is they give you a drink with a lot of glucose, 75 grams to be specific, and at two hours later, you still have a glucose greater than 200. You can be considered pre-diabetes if you have a fasting glucose greater than 100 but less than 20, 126, or having that oral glucose tolerance test two levels of greater than 140 but less than 200. So criteria for testing and diagnosis of gestational diabetes. With this one, if you're over age 25, you're overweight, have a family strong family history, have abnormal glucose metabolism, have had a history of a poor obstetric outcome, have a presence of glycosuria, which is glucose in the urine. If you have polycystic ovarian disease, or again, the race, African-American, Latino, or Native American. In order to be diagnosed with gestational diabetes, you have to have a certain criteria. Usually all moms um, around 20 some weeks of gestation will have um, a test done and called the O'Sullivan test. That is where 50 grams of glucose are drank and then they draw your blood an hour later. If you fail that, okay, and your blood sugar is greater than 140 milligrams per deciliter, which is what happened with two out of my three children, I had to do the three hour oral glucose tolerance test. So if two out of four of these values happens or um, is, is met or exceeded, then you're considered to have gestational diabetes and they will treat you. If your fasting glucose is greater than 105, if your one hour is um, greater than 190, two hours greater than 165, and three hours greater than 145, two out of four of those, you're considered to have gestational diabetes. All right, we now have the other end of the spectrum. Diabetes can cause a high glucose, but also if a diabetic takes too much insulin, they could have hypoglycemia. Let's say they're taking their insulin and they're not eating enough. This can cause decreased plasma glucose levels. It can be transient and relatively insignificant, or quite life-threatening. It occurs in healthy appearing and sick patients as a result of a reaction to medication or illness sometimes. And usually they see symptoms when their blood sugar gets around 50. Once they get around 50, a diabetic will tell you they're very familiar with these. They have increased hunger, they may sweat, get nauseous, sometimes vomiting, feel dizzy, have nervousness, shaking, blurred speech and sight, and be mentally confused. Usually we say someone's hypoglycemic when their plasma glucose levels are less than 70. Again, symptoms occur around 50. Trembling, sweating, nausea, rapid pulse, lightheadedness, hunger, and epigastric discomfort, which we just talked about. So the role of the laboratory in differential diagnosis and management of patients. We do a lot of glucose testing. Testing can be done with point of care, which you did in week three. Or we can use a very sophisticated analyzer for uh, monitoring glucose as well, especially when blood glucose levels get so high that the um, point of care meters can't even read those levels. We can do this measurement from serum plasma or whole blood. Serum or plasma must be refrigerated and separated from the cells within one hour. What will happen if you don't is those cells will start to eat the glucose to maintain life within that test tube. Fasting blood glucose should be obtained in the morning after eight to 10 hour fast. The most common methods of glucose analysts are glucose oxidase and hexokinase. Make sure you know those. Nonspecific methods are used in a urinalysis section as well to look for glucose in the urine. Diab diabetics usually um, check their blood sugar levels three to four times a day to make sure that they're within range. Having a high level of glucose for a long period of time can be quite damaging to multiple organ systems. Some of the things that they do to check for diabetes, we talked about the um, gestational diabetes, but we can do a two hour postprandial test. Um, we'll have someone drink 75 grams and measure their glucose two hours later. Um, that is one way that we can test for diabetes or do an oral glucose tolerance test, which is not um, recommended by the ADA. Drinking the 75 grams is um, what we would do. Now, they have to be careful and look at a number of things. You don't just say, oh, I wonder if you're diabetic and give them a 75 gram load. You have to be kind of careful and see what their fasting blood sugar is first. The reference ranges you have to memorize for adults is 70 to 110 milligrams per deciliter. Children, it tends to be a little bit lower, 
and spinal fluid is 40 to 70. So spinal fluid is quite interesting. In a case of, of a patient with a um, meningitis, their blood glucose levels, or their spinal fluid glucose tends to be quite low. All right, a couple more tests here. Another test we do is a glycosylated hemoglobin or a hemoglobin A1C. This can be done as a long-term glucose regulation um, to see how well they've been following their glucose measurement over the last three months. So if you are a patient and you decide that you are going to eat cheesecake and bread and cookies every day, and then one week before your appointment, you're just going to eat really, really good. So when the doctor um, does your blood sugar, it's going to be perfect. Well, not so fast. They do an A1C, which gives a bigger look at the last, um, I would say, six to eight weeks, um, or maybe a little more, to uh, see how well you've been doing. If you've been sitting with a blood sugar of 200 most of the time, the doctor's going to know it because you're going to have quite a high percentage of glycosylated hemoglobin in your blood. The reference range is 4.5 to 8% of your hemoglobin. And for every 1% change, there's a 35 milligram per deciliter change in the mean of it. So if you know, you're keeping around a 200, you're going to be double. So you're probably going to have a very high hemoglobin A1C. We do this on whole blood EDTA or purple top tube. Another test that we do sometimes um, are ketone tests. This is produced by the liver through the metabolism of fatty acids. In the absence of glucose or being unable to use glucose, it will provide an energy source from lipids. So it can take your fat, break it down, and turn it into ketones where it can be used for energy. Increased carbohydrate deprivation or decreased carbohydrate use, such as diabetes, starvation, fasting, or high-fat diets, can cause these to occur. If you are a diabetic, this is not a good situation because it means that you don't have enough insulin to use your glucose. If you are on the Atkins diet, South Beach diet, something like that, or if you're a bodybuilder who's trying to cut fat, you may want to have more ketones present because that means you're breaking down fat and using that as energy instead of using carbohydrates. There are three types of ketones. One of them is acetone, and it actually kind of smells like nail polish remover. Acetoacetic acid, and this is what we use for in the urine um, reagents. We test for a lot of ketones in the urine, especially diabetic patients will have high ketones. Um, and 3-beta-hydroxybutyric acid is about 78% of all um, ketones as well. Usually we use fresh serum or urine. So we'll be able to tell if somebody's having an issue using carbohydrates or not eating any or they're starving, we'll see ketones present. And actually, people on the Atkins diet can buy those test strips at any drugstore just to test their urine for ketones. Microalbuminuria is an increase in urinary albumin and is an early sign of renal nephropathy um, from diabetes mellitus. So if you have high levels of sugars a lot, it's going to be hard on your kidneys. What's going to happen is the kidneys, where they're normally able to repel albumin, are going to start letting small or micro amounts of albumin through the glomerular basement membrane and into those tubules within the kidneys. Well, what happens then is we can pick up those small amounts of albumin in the urine. The earlier we can catch these micro amounts, the better we can treat the patient and hopefully prevent too much further damage. And the last test is an islet autoantibody. This would be looking for autoantibodies to those beta cells in the islets of Langerhans and the pancreas, um, which would diagnose type 1 diabetes if they did have um, the other issues with that. That would be our section on carbohydrates. Thank you.